What's going on, gang? And welcome back to Scared of Normal. I'm Mike Murphy, and today we're stoked to welcome ultra athlete and all around badass Anton Kropitschka to the show. Thank you so much for being here, man. Yeah, Mike. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the invite. Yeah, this is. I feel like I say this a lot when we have really cool people on, but this is an episode that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. And you're such a busy guy, so I really appreciate you carving some time out to ride your bike over here. You rode from <laughs> Boulder, right? Yeah, I mean, I I kind of. I try to like commute around on the bike. Uh, it's funny. My partner Haley and I are between the two of us. We actually have three vehicles right now, but okay. both of us spend a lot of time riding our bikes around, just you know, commuting. So yeah, and it's easy. It's like less than twenty miles to get over here. So, Amazing. Yeah, it's like an hour ride. Heck yeah, dude. But, yeah, yeah, I figured you you were gonna roll up on the bikes when I saw you like cruise in. I was like, hell yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> You're the <laughs> first guest to commute via bike for an uh, episode so well, congratulations yeah, yeah. on that <laughs> Thanks, <dude. laughs> so for those of you who are unfamiliar or for for anyone who is unfamiliar with who you are how would you describe who you are to a stranger on the street ah uh, man well that's something that's always evolving or i feel like it's involved a lot over the last maybe five years but historically i'm most known for being a professional mountain ultra runner uh i've that's been the case for the last 17 years since 2006 and over the last decade, I've kind of evolved into being more of a multi-sport athlete. So not just running trails, but also I would say adventure riding, cycling, uh, riding bikes, are uh, just kind of like the bike lifestyle and rock climbing. And then in the winter, some skiing. So yeah, those are the main, I don't know, outdoor activities of my life, but it's like what comprises my life too you yeah know? <laughs> all encompassing man i love yeah. it yeah that's something that's always been so cool to me about you because when i first became familiar with you is right when you were starting to get on the bike and just mm. being so capable to get out there and do a little bit of everything is such a cool thing yeah i mean i'm not a fast cyclist i'm i will never be i never would have been like a traditional professional cyclist but i really enjoy riding bikes and i think they're such a cool vehicle by which to live your life and yeah i don't know that's kind of where i put my focus i love it man <clears throat> so let's throw it all the way back to the beginning where'd you grow up i grew up in this small town in northeast nebraska called niobrera it's like 350 people uh, i actually grew up on a farm ranch seven miles outside of there so tiny uh my high school graduating class had 12 people including me no um, way. <laughs> not a private school public <laughs> school definitely just a, a rural uh, farm and ranch community. Um, but that's where I started running to in, well, middle school, really. So that would have been 95, so 28 years ago, almost 30 years ago. Now. So, yeah. Were there any other sports that appealed to you at that time, or was it just strictly running? Well, in a small, small town community like that, high school sports is a pretty big part of like the fabric of the community. So when you're a kid, you kind of are always aspiring to be sort of like a varsity three-sport athlete, um, which for boys would be football, basketball, track uh, in Nebraska. So I played a couple seasons of football, a couple seasons of basketball, but I started writing when I was 11. So that, and I was obsessed immediately. So that was always what took precedence for sure. That's amazing. Did you enjoy school? Yeah, yeah. I was a pretty academic kid. Um, you know, my class of 12, I was top of my class. And uh, in undergrad, I went to undergrad down in Colorado Springs and actually ended up doing like three degrees there, um, undergraduate degrees. But post undergrad, I lost my motivation for school. <laughs> Obviously, I was very committed um, getting my bachelor's degrees. But after that, it's like I had kind of fulfilled that, oh, I don't know, like almost ego academic need of like, this is a part of my identity. And so my motivation for grad school was highly dim diminished. And my running was really also taking off at the same time and um, actually became like a full time professional athlete uh, halfway through grad school. So that didn't help my yeah. focus at all juggling all the things at <laughs> yeah once. like the semester i was going to be defending my thesis i was in south america for a month um like november of that year and it's just like really i'm just 
like supposed to be writing my thesis <laughs> and I'm in like Rio and Sao Paulo, like, you know, for New Balance at the time. And yeah. Was, were yeah. your teachers understanding of that or were they like, what are you doing, man? I don't know. I, no, they, I don't think they were understanding. Um, graduate school, like you should be an adult at that point and you should own what your priorities are and what your commitments are. And I just wasn't really doing that. I wasn't committed to grad school anymore at that point. So, and that's fine, you know. That's life, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Things change. <laughs> did you end up graduating from that program? No, I did everything um, except f defend my thesis. I basically wrote it. I did all the research, did all the like data analysis, all of it, and then just like didn't defend it. Crazy. Um, and it was because I was on this international trip for like half the semester. Wow. Know? I was just like, well, when am I going to go to South America again? And and I was just like, when international travel started for me, this should have been 2011. Um, and now, I mean, I, you know, I've traveled a ton internationally, but I still think of it as a crazy opportunity that I try not to take for granted. Certainly. You know? So yeah. was that something that you were conscious of at the time is like, that gamble like did you even think of it as a gamble like not finishing the program or I, no i didn't think of it as a gamble because i technically took a leave of absence and you have like four years from when you started your master's degree to finish it basically and it's like i was like oh maybe i'll take a semester or a year off here but no i never went back Heck yeah. which doesn't you know i don't i can't remember what my intentions were when i took that leave of absence but yeah i mean it's not surprising i didn't go back seems like it paid off so that's cool it's worked out yeah yeah for the past decade plus so i don't know it's fine yeah. Heck yeah so going back to like that middle schooler out there running did you ever even consider at that point in time like middle school high school that this could ever be a career for you definitely not a career but i was really committed and serious about it right from the beginning so i started running when i was 11 and 18 months later when i was still 12 i uh, ran my first marathon you know full length 26 mile marathon and what didn't even think of it as being like this anomaly or kind of like wild thing to do. It was just, uh, I just wanted to do it and I could do it. And so I did, you know, and, you know, of course all the adults around me were like, I don't know, supportive or sort of like impressed, but I didn't feel like I was doing anything crazy. You know, it was just, I was capable of doing it. So I did it. Um, but I guess when I graduated college, I never thought of like, oh, this could be a career, but I did think like, oh, I wonder like if I could get sponsored, you know, like if I could get some free shoes basically. And I mean, eventually that's what happened. And um, yeah, and then it, things just kind of like progressed and snowballed from there over the next couple of years. Sure. Yeah. Do you remember what initially tr attracted you to the sport? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, so it's, it's kind of like it was something that was always innate in me, you know, running a marathon when I was so young. I was obviously – always curious about my personal boundaries or limits um, or just like, yeah, yeah, just like curious about what I'm was capable of. And I wasn't finding success at the traditional distance events of track in high school and college, which is, you know, one mile, two mile, 5k, even 10k in college compared to, you know, what I ended up specializing in. Those are really short, fast events, um, you know, compared to a mountain hundred miler that might take 15 or 20 hours. Um, so what attracted me to it was just, I seemed to have an aptitude for it, you know, and, and cross country practice in college, I was never very good at the interval workouts, the speed workouts, but I was always really good at the long runs, you know, and I would be able to drop guys who would beat me in races on long runs, but then, you know, they'd, they'd beat me in like a five mile race. Uh, so it seemed like that was just where my strengths were, um, yeah, so that's what attracted me to it. And but I always but I was attracted to it in high school even. Um you know, on my training journals, my training logs, I had like cut out pictures from magazines of guys in the late 90s who were at the top of the sport of mountain ultra marathons and you know, pasted them on the cover, you know, when I was a teenager. And that's cool. So yeah, yeah, I was like into I knew of 100-mile races and mountain ultras and wanted was always curious about them, but I just, I don't know. I was aware of the opportunity that it was to be on a collegiate cross country team and track team. So, you know, I did that for four years and then, but once I was free of that, I, yeah, immediately did my first ultra basically. That's so, so cool. Yeah. So talking about like 
looking at the magazines, were there anybody or any certain individuals that stood out to you as like in inspiration or motivators for you? hundred percent. Yeah. Two that come to mind are, uh, this guy, Matt Carpenter, who he lives down in Manitou Springs and he has won, uh, either the Pikes Peak Marathon or the Pikes Peak Ascent, I think 20 times as the course record on both still. Um, and that course record is it's 30 years old now. Um, and no one's really even come close to it. That's so insane. He was, yeah. So he was just sort of head and shoulders above everyone else at that event. And he still has the course record of the Leadville 100, uh, which ended up being my first ultra. So Matt was someone when I went to Colorado Springs for college, I ended up meeting and doing some running with. Uh, so it was like, you know, one of those meet your hero situations. And then another, so he was on a cover of a train log. And then another one was a guy who lives here in Boulder, actually, Scott Jurek. Um, he won the most important North American race in the sport, the Western States 100, seven times in a row in the aughts. So when I was in high school and college, he was kind of the most important North American ultra marathoner um, or most relevant, I guess. So yeah, those two guys for sure. I looked up to. That's super cool. Yeah. It's cool. You got to like run with them too. And... Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's one of those things where if I think about my life rationally, it's just kind of funny how it's all played out, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. That is beautiful. So you talk about coming to Colorado for college. Is that what initially brought you here? Yeah, but it was, uh, I came to Colorado deliberately cause I wanted to I wanted to be a mountain runner. I wanted to run in the mountains. Um, I applied to a bunch of different schools. Most of the other ones were in the Midwest, all private liberal arts schools. And there's only one of those really in the Rocky Mountain region. That's Colorado College in Colorado Springs. And I was fortunate enough to get a full tuition science scholarship there. So my college decision was made very easy. It's that's like, amazing. That's in the mountains and, you know, tuition's free. I'm gone. You know? Did you, did the scholarship come from academics or from sport? Academics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As a science scholarship, but I had to major in a natural science then. Beautiful. So, yeah. Wow. Had you ever come out to Colorado before moving out here full time? Yeah. So growing up, my family, we, we would take uh, a one to two week, like camping road trip every summer visiting national parks in the Western United States. So I'd been to Colorado a number of times um, as, you know, a kid and a teenager. And uh, we had a family friend who lives on the Western Slope and we visited them a couple of times. So yeah, I was familiar with the Rocky Mountains for sure. Heck yeah. yeah. Kept drawing you back in, it sounds like. Yeah, it was, I think those camping trips were more formative for my desire to be in the mountains than anything. Um, yeah. So, Heck yeah. yeah. So you talked about having several degrees. What all degrees do you have under your belt at this point in time? Yeah. So all just bachelors, but, uh, I ended up studying physics, philosophy, and geology. Jeez. Uh, yeah. At CC. So. All across the board, man. Yeah. The physics and the philosophy are, I don't know, two sides of the same coin. Basically you're just like answering the big questions by two sort of opposing, uh, like dichotomy uh, methods, one being kind of intellectualizing and other like doing really hard math. Um, <laughs> but they're all just like, oh, what does it all mean? Um, and then geology was sort of this uh, more pragmatic degree that I slammed through and just like a little over a year at the end of my college career because I knew that I wasn't smart enough to go to grad school in physics and I was too kind of clear eyed about the usefulness of philosophy as a graduate degree. I didn't want to be an academic basically. So I did the geology degree and that's what I, I ended up going to grad school in, uh, well, it ended up being geography, but I was doing physical geography. So I was doing mountain hydrology. But, okay. Yeah, yeah. So going to school and balancing sport, like how were you balancing training and like studying? Uh, as an undergrad, I was pretty good at it. I was just like really committed to both. Um, and that was, you know, I had a social life too, but that was sort of built into the cross country team. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. You just have so much more energy when you're 19, 20 years old and yeah, running a hundred miles a week, taking hard physics classes all the time. I was just able to do it all. But I remember like, especially when I was in a physics course, like being stressed, you know? Um, but then in grad school, I didn't balance it well at all. Like things skewed towards running, like, to 
a high degree. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I don't blame yeah. you. <laughs> so was it just running when you were in college or did you feel st- called towards cycling at that point or climbing or was it you just sole focus yeah so i started both riding bikes and climbing in college like my freshman year basically like first week first semester for sure um and that was you know climbing was just something i was interested in uh i remember like finding a friend on the dorm floor same floor as me in the dorm and going out to the garden of the guys and him basically like teaching me the basics um and then cycling, I got into it as a cross training activity. Basically, I was I got a stress fracture in my shin, spring of my freshman year. Uh, I bought my first real bike. It was just like a an aluminum road bike. Um, rode it a ton, uh, plenty of centuries. I did one ride in particular that was sort of indicative of where I'd go with cycling, where uh, I rode from Aspen all the way back to Colorado Springs in a single push. It was like 160 miles and you know, it's net downhill for a couple thousand feet, but still like, that's a long ride. It was like a nine hour ride. Yeah, that's a yeah. solid push. Yeah. Yeah. At that point in time, it was definitely the longest I'd ever exercised for a given period of time. <laughs> and, uh, do you think that lit a fire for you? It was just another one of those like, Oh, cause it was, I don't know. It was a really satisfying experience and it was, it felt like a really natural thing to be riding my bike all day. And so it was just another like little nudge in that direction of ultra endurance instead of the more traditional running distances. Um, yeah, it just felt like I have an aptitude for this. This comes naturally to me rather than trying to run faster around a track. So, Heck yeah. yeah. So, so you touched on a little bit earlier, you know, when you're supposed to be defending your thesis, you go off <clears> after <throat> this thing that you're passionate about to go pursue it with a sponsor. When did the sponsors start coming around for you? Yeah, so the first real ultra I ran was the 2006 Leadville 100, uh, which is a legendary race in North America, second oldest 100 miler. Um, Been going on since 1983, which coincidentally is the year I was born, actually. Um, Funny little. That's pretty cool. Yeah, where it lines up like that. But I ran that in 2006, won it. And a couple weeks after that race, maybe the week after that race, the athlete manager at La Sportiva here in Boulder was just like, Hey, like, congratulations on the win. I saw you were wearing a pair of our shoes. Um, do you want a free pair of shoes? And I was like, yeah, of course. And then that turned into like a formal product sponsorship basically. Um, the second year of that, I got like 500 or a thousand bucks in cash or something, you know, it's just super nominal, like cover a couple entry fees kind of thing. Uh, but then the next year, this has been 2008, I, um, New Balance became interested for whatever reason. And that eventually turned into like a real, like salary that I could live on, uh, by like 2010, I would say. So dang, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I was super fortunate to be kind of at the front of like the sport has grown a ton in the last decade but I was sort of on the front end of guys who were able to make a full-time living at it based on sponsorship support. Heck yeah. So when that came around, were you just like, well, I don't really need to use these degrees now. Like, did you, were you like starting to look for jobs in those fields or? Uh, Not really. I went to grad school because I felt like it's what I was supposed to do. Like I, you know, you have an under undergraduate degree. It's like, well, Grad school, like grad school for me was no risk because I was on a research assistantship and a teaching assistantship. So I was getting paid $1,600 a month to go to school um, as opposed to having to like pony up my own money to go to school. So I was incentivized. It was like a job to go to school. And and at that point in time, it felt like a a pretty well-paying job, which is hilarious to think, think, like 1,600 bucks a month. But, (laughs) you know, I was paying like, $400 $400 a month or something in rent back then. So it was, I could live off of it. No problem. Um, but you know, I, and leading up to grad school, I had spent two summers living out of my truck, actually up in Leadville, working at the coffee shop there. Um, so I don't know. I was just used to having very little overhead in my life. I didn't, I didn't need much. Um, kind of prided myself on that for sure. Uh, Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. Well, talking about having the low overhead in your life, the idea of doing more with less has always been something that I feel like you've been so proficient at over, 
your lifetime, did that develop at a young age for you or do you even know where that came from? Yeah, I mean, that it came from the way my parents raised me for sure. Like my parents were and are big proponents of, you know, anti-consumerism, uh, living a self-sufficient, like simple life. Uh, you know, I grew up on a homestead where like we had big gardens and orchard, a wood lot, uh, you know, uh, outhouse. <laughs> like it just, it was like a pretty, I don't know, rugged upbringing, I guess you could say. So I, from a very young age, you know, I always had a, jobs in the summer growing up. Um, yeah, I just had this value of like self-reliance, I guess. And like that I, I can, like I'm responsible for myself and I can like figure out how to get it done on my own. And, uh, so when I became, you know, an adult in the world, I definitely took that. That was like one of the guiding values in my life. So it's like, okay, like I remember, I just remember thinking around this period of time, this would have been during the aughts, basically. I was like, if I can come up with a thousand bucks a month, that's really all like I can even like put some money away each month if I have that much coming in. Um, which, you know, 12 grand a year is not that hard to come by. Like, so I was always working uh, you know, I worked at running shoe stores, uh, yeah, worked as a barista. It's, it was fine, you know? So, but then, so then when I started getting paid like an actual salary, it was just like, oh, this is, this is sustainable, you That's know? Super cool. Like it was more money than I ever thought I would ever certainly make running, but like, it was like as good of money, if not better than most of the job prospects I had as like a hydrologist or like, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. so I would assume as you started making a, you know, a little bit more money on the salary with New Balance, you're starting to travel around a lot more. Were you still living out of the truck at that point in time? No, and I only lived out of the truck in the summer times. Uh, uh, so basically, let's see, 2008, 2008, 2009, I was in the truck in the summer and then 12, 13, 14. Um, cause I was in grad school, like 2010, 2011. So I had an apartment here in Boulder. Okay. Uh, cause I was at grad school in CU. Um, no, it was never like full time year round in the truck. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. brutal out here in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that and and I like I like the stability of kind of like my own space and like a home nest. Um, but I haven't been, I haven't lived in my truck significantly since 2014. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about doing this big bike ride from Colorado Springs to Aspen, or from vice versa. Vice versa, yeah. 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 What comes after that, like in terms of big distances for you? Like, where did you go after that? Yeah, so that would have been 2003, but I really didn't get into what might be considered like ultra marathon. I guess it was just the next year, actually, 2004. Um, I did like my first 30 miler on foot, uh, raced a couple other marathons. Um, but, you know, a 30 miler is like technically sort of considered an ultra. And then it just kind of progressed from there. In 05, I did like a 40 miler on my own. And then 06 is when I did the the 100 mile race the first time. So yeah. yeah, it was, I was, but I, in 05 and 06, I was, I was experimenting with kind of extreme high mileage. Uh, you know, 200 miles a week running is silly. Like it's not something I'd ever recommend, but it's sort of like an experience in my life that, you know, I kind of pushed for a couple of years that, I don't know, shaped me in a lot of ways. So I can't really say that um, I regret it or anything, but it's definitely not the best way to train for anything. Yeah, it's probably yeah. pretty rough on the body, hey? Yeah, it's just like, you know, when you're spending 30 hours a week just running, like it's, that's pretty all consuming. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have any memories from that period of time while you're out there putting in these 200 mile weeks where you're just like down in the dirt, like how you were picking yourself back up or? I mean, you're just tired all the time, yeah. like exhausted all the time, you know? And even, you know, I'd have been, what, 24, 25 years old, like your recovery abilities, at least my recovery abilities at that time were far, far higher than they are now, you know, almost 15 years later. But uh, you you are just kind of in this perpetual state of exhaustion, you know? Can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you have any injuries that came along with like those? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was always injured a little bit. But I mean, you know, I would have like these two, three month stretches where I'd be staying healthy and then I would get an injury, of course. And, um, yeah, that's been the story of my career is just kind of bouncing back and forth in the cycle of injury. Heck so, yeah. yeah. 
how do you deal with injury? Like when you're going through that, is there like something that a routine for you or is it different with each type of injury? Uh, it used to be the answer would be, I dealt with it poorly. Like I, I didn't, um, I would basically just take time off and like not do anything specific to kind of like maintain my mental health during that time. Cause you know, my mental health was and is to a certain degree still really wrapped up in my running. And, you know, when you have to take six weeks or eight weeks off, A, you get like really out of shape, but, and that doesn't help your confidence or like how you feel about the world. Um, but also you just don't have that routine and focus and um, endorphins like on a daily basis anymore. Like you're going to have low points, but basically in 2015, uh, I mean, I found the bike as like the means to cope with all that. And life has been a lot more even keel the last decade than it was That's the previous amazing. decade, basically. The bike is a joy machine. Man. <laughs> it is. But for the main thing about it for me is that it's something I can rely on. Like it's, I can, I can like make plans for the future <laughs> that are revolve around the bike, which I still have a hard time doing with running because I don't know if I'm going to be healthy in six months. You know, I was, it's like, I know in six months, I'm still going to be able to pedal a bike. I just basically don't get injured on the bike, you know? And, uh, so that it just adds a level of like stability and even keelness to your life. It's, you know, necessary. Heck yeah. So I want to jump back to talking about that international travel. So okay. over your career, you've traveled to some incredible places. Do you have any that really stand out in terms of like zones or culture for you that are your favorites? Yeah. Um, I mean, I spent a ton of time in Europe because a lot of my sponsors are in Europe. Mountain running is big in Europe. Uh, it's a popular sport over there. But, you know, in that period of time, um, you know, when I quit, grad school at the very, right at the very end of it. It's funny, starting with that trip to Rio and Sao Paulo, in the next 12 months, um, I went to every continent except Antarctica. No yeah. way. Yeah, it was like, I realized this recently for some reason. And I was like, God, what a crazy time in your life. That's you know? a whirlwind, man. Yeah, because I'd gone, before that trip to South America, I'd been overseas once before, you know, just on like a personal trip to Europe. Um, and so then the next 12 months to hit every continent, except like, you know, polar ice cap, the um, one that hardly, any yeah, no one, go, no one goes there anyways. except for like <laughs> scientists and people like, you know, checking a box. But, uh, yeah, it was crazy, but I would say favorite would probably be, uh, I don't know. I've been to Argentina, uh, to El Chaltén and Patagonia and that's. Maybe I just like it the most because I was there on a climbing trip and not a running trip. I wasn't there for a race. so A little more chill. Yeah. All the other stuff, all the other travel I've done or a lot of the other travel I've done is it's all like work. It's, it's someone else's agenda. I'm giving talks. I'm going to retailers or I'm like running a race. And so it's hard to – I'm not on my own schedule. Um, but so that trip – there was just like good vibes about it for me because it was something that was self-motivated. Um, I mean, I had sponsor support for it, but it was kind of like whether or not we got anything done down there was totally up to the weather basically, you know? Um, so there was less, I don't know. It just felt more like I had more like autonomy and agency with it. So yeah, Patagonia sticks out in my mind. Um, you know, I bet I was in Japan and the thing about being in Japan was it felt truly foreign to me, you know, and you go to Europe and it's like, I don't know. It's like a more sophisticated, older version of, of still America. like related though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you go to Japan, you're like, this is a different planet. Like the way that they construct society around here is totally different than Western society. Uh, the it's like the social sort of interactions and, and customs and, yeah, it's just, it's obviously like you can't, like the alphabet is not an alphabet. Yeah, it's all like figures and stuff. And so I don't know, it it, it was a truly just kind of like shake up your perspective experience. Um, 
so that one stands out too. That's but, cool. Yeah. What were you doing when you were in Japan? Was that for well? Anything? So that was that was one of those cases where I was like signed up to run a race, um, got injured, didn't do it, but still went over because surrounding the race was a whole bunch of like promotional stuff for a couple of sponsors. So yeah, I have had a lot of that happen where I was signed up to do a race, got injured, but then still went to the event for like sponsor ambassadorship reasons that's pretty cool though do you feel like you're able to be more immersed in in like the cultures or the places when you are injured and you're going over there for more of the promotional stuff definitely like there's just less pressure because there's no performance aspect but there's a much higher angst aspect of like and sort of like imposter syndrome aspect of like what am i even doing here if i can't even be performing like the function that i'm supposed to i'm supposed to be an athlete you know but i'm all injured uh like i have because then I've gone abroad and had good races, and then you have like some photo shoot afterwards or something, or some meet and greet, or you're giving a talk or signing posters, and you're just like, just feel so much more legit afterwards. Yeah, know? for sure. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I just crushed that it race. It like and, validates. Yeah, yeah. It's like I should be signing this autograph. I should be taking this <laughs> selfie. You know, like, but when you don't have that validating performance to back it up, it all just feels really kind of alienating and hollow. It's it's because you you have this certain vision of yourself and you don't have that vision of yourself reflected back at you by the people who are there because they have this um, kind of this avatar for them of like, Oh, this is like the American ultra runner or whatever. And you don't, or at least I don't see myself in that projection basically. So there's just this dissonance that can, yeah, it can be alienating. And definitely when I was in my twenties, I found that, you know, even early thirties, I found that hard, but, uh, now in my late thirties, you know, like last, just last year, uh, I was in South Africa for a race and I'm just more comfortable with myself, more secure in my identity and who I am in the industry and in the world. And so it makes a trip like that so much more pleasant than just being like full of angst the whole time, you know? (laughs) Yeah. That totally makes sense, man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure even just talking about that imposter syndrome, when you're kind of sitting there and you're watching everybody you compete against, like out there winning and participating totally, and you're just like, well, I'm going to give you a high five and I didn't get to do that today. So yeah, that's hard. Yeah. 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 And it's, yeah. And it's just makes you feel less than basically. Sure. Uh, That trip to Japan, has that been your only time over there? Only time to Japan. Yeah. I, I had a different trip where I was in Singapore, but you know, it was a completely different country. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any aspirations to go back there? I feel like there's a ton of insane zones over there. Yeah. Japan is an interesting country to me. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely jump at an opportunity to go back there again. And I've had a couple of race invites over the last few years. Like I think maybe pre COVID that, um, I think I was just injured at the time or something, but yeah, if something came up again, I would definitely, I would head back to Japan for sure. Heck yeah. yeah. Well, talking about, all of these premier races and the ones that you have participated in, are there any that stand out to you as a favorite? Huh? Yeah, it's funny. So just in, gosh, this is crazy. Like 10 days, I'll be heading back over to Italy and La Sportiva is my main sponsor. They're based in Northern Italy. Their big race sponsorship of the year is this race in the Dolomites there called uh, the Lavaredo 120K. And I ran that race in 2014, but I'll be heading over again. Just well, they're having an athlete meeting the week before, so I'm heading over for that. Basically, not running the race this year, um, but that one is my favorite because it's. I think it's kind of considered the second biggest kind of ultra festival in Europe, behind the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc (UTMB) at the end of August. Um, so there's a lot of hype and kind of like industry stuff around it, but it's more low key than UTMB. And it's in an arguably like more beautiful part of the Alps. Yeah, even. that place like, looks incredible. Yeah, Cortina and the Dolomites are crazy. So I like that one. Um, yeah. Heck yeah. Do you have any favorite results from any of these races? Like obviously winning is good, but do you have any yeah. that you didn't win where you're just like, I'm really stoked that I placed that well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Probably one that I didn't win, but I was still really happy with was this race in 2012 in uh, Spain, in the Pyrenees. And kind of the top sort of, I don't know, I think most people would call him the goat of mountain running is this uh, Spanish runner, Killian Jornet. Jornet. Uh, And he beat me, but we ran most of the race together. 
And then he just kind of ran away in the last like five miles and beat me by like, you know, a couple minutes. Um, but it was pretty cool to have that experience of running with him, racing with him all day and getting second to him is nothing to ever be disappointed by. So yeah, I was, that's awesome. Yeah. But that was, gosh, that was a decade ago already. Yeah. That's crazy. Right. <laughs> Time does yeah, certainly yeah, fly. Yeah. So something that's always fascinated me with you is that your approach to the ultra running scene has always seemed so different and so like uniquely you. Is that something you've been conscious of crafting throughout your what, like journey or is that just something that's just happened? So when, when I started out, it was just something that happened. Like uh, when you don't know anything about a scene or, you know, I was just fresh to the world of ultra running and so I just did things my way, the way that made sense to me. Um, but then you get all this kind of reflection back at you that you're like different and you're doing things differently. And, and you kind of get the sense that you don't quite see things the same way as everyone else. Yeah. Then I, then I became aware of it. And then it's not like I, Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think we all like are, kind of in the process of crafting an identity for ourselves, and that identity I don't think it's necessarily healthy but it's, it's kind of hard for it not to be sort of defined in uh like opposition to something you sure. know and like that's that's what makes an individual feel unique is if you're not the same as the rest of the crowd you know I don't like the contrarian kind of reactionary subtext to that, but eventually that's the way I definitely felt in the ultra world of the sport just was growing in a way and kind of evolving in a way that I just didn't identify with. So then I kind of like developed a chip on my shoulder about like, well, I'm not going to be that way and I'm going to be doing my own thing and whatever. And I have like this aspect to my personality or identity or skill set that's different from the quote unquote mainstream, which is hilarious to say because ultra running is such a non-mainstream fringe activity to begin with. Totally. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess that's how I'd answer that question. Heck yeah. yeah. No, that's a beautiful answer. And like, what do originality and authenticity mean to you? God, I mean, that's, you know, such, such like buzzwords, but yeah. it's so hard to know and sometimes I wonder if it's even important, you know, like if what you're, you know, the idea of being yourself, of being original and being true to yourself and who you are, you just have to be in constant dialogue with yourself about what your true motivations are. Um, you have to have an underlying value structure that you've thought about and feel good about. And then that can give you, oh, I don't know, a basis upon which to make decisions that come up you know, it's silly decisions that like what kind of, you know, what's going to be my strategy in this race or like, you know, what's going to be sort of like my tactic here as opposed to like larger life decisions like, you know, what, what career path am I going to take? Like, uh, you know, how, you know, what vehicle am I going to drive and what does that say about, you know, what my values are and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess that's how I think about it. Heck yeah. Yeah. I always struggle with those words myself just because they seem like they're so overly used in marketing and business anymore, where it's just like, look how authentic this thing is. So yeah, it's, it's almost, a, you're saying. yeah, the authentic thing is almost a tell that it, it's like, it's like doth protest too much. Like, like, look how, you know, like be authentic. It's like, well, if you have to worry about being authentic, it's probably not authentic. Yeah. You know, it's like, like people more. know it when they see it, you yeah. know, like it's, a it's feeling, something you right? can feel exactly. And, and that's, um, yeah, that's something you can't like market or like put a put a label on or brand it, you know. And so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I love kind of segueing this talking about like that authentic piece. Like, it seems to me like you know your partnerships have been somewhat organic, and they really do fit who you are. How do you go about like working with different brands? It comes back to kind of that value structure thing, but then you're always you're always balance, or at least I'm always balancing. Uh, the realities of making a living this way too. So, I mean, I've done things that I'm not particularly proud of simply because there's a paycheck involved, you know, whether that be like most of them involved being have like some kind of sponsored post on social media, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and like, it's funny because I did one in the past, sometime in the past six months 
And I sort of swore like, that's it, the last one, I'm done. Because I just, it was, I was just so full of angst about it the whole time. And uh, it's just not worth it to me anymore. You yeah. know, like I don't, um, so yeah, decisions about it is, again, it's like a gut, it's a gut feeling like, yeah, this feels, um, feels right. It feels true to like what I care about. And, uh, you know, a company like La Sportiva, uh, you know, I was with New Balance for eight years before that I've been with Sportiva now and like another eight years, both of those are still like privately owned family companies, essentially. Um, I mean, you know, New Balance in particular is really big. It's a several billion dollar company, but it doesn't have any stockholders that it's. That's always so bizarre to me. But that like is that private. They're, or, yeah, that they're still American made. That they're well, it's like twenty five percent American made. They have yeah, five five factors. Forget in North that America, they've started but, outsourcing, yeah. but yeah. that they are here. That's a bizarre thing to me. Yeah, yeah, but um, Italy or, or uh, La Sportiva in Italy, it's the same way. It's you know their climbing shoes, their top level climbing shoes are all handmade in Italy, like in this little Jeez. valley in the Dolomites, because it's such a it's such a technical piece of footwear. Like it has to be handmade to be the best. Um, some of their uh, their running shoes and approach shoes are made overseas, but there's very much a family company. It's something like four or five generations now um, in the past hundred years. And it's a very tight knit, community minded organization. And yeah, I mean, it's private, you know, it's not a publicly traded company. So it allows you to, to stay true to your core values and uh, be a little more nimble with uh, being innovative and new products and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I've really appreciated being, you know, having companies like that be my main sponsors over the years for yeah, sure. That's really cool. Being able to like talk to the people who are actually involved. And, yeah, totally. You know, they're yeah. not trying to appease the stockholders by making products that they think are going to sell. And yeah. And just like always coming out with like new colorways and new, like, you know, Sportiva in particular, they have like the sh my favorite running shoe from them. They've been making it for a decade now, you know, which is unheard of in the running shoe world. Like usually it's just like next one, six months later, six months later, new colorway, you know, it's just like some like minor cosmetic update just to like say it's a new model, you know, um, and some of their climbing shoes they've been making for 20 or even 30 no years way. at this point. Yeah. It's just like barely any changes to them. Cause like when something works, it works and they stick to it and they commit to it. Yeah. Well, know. that's beautiful too, especially from a performance aspect. Mm -hmm. I would assume like, you know what you're going to get every single time as opposed yeah. to like changing footwear all the time and being like, okay, is this going to blow apart at 80 miles or whatever it is? Well, that's the thing, especially in the running world. It's, it's something, you know, you find a favorite shoe of yours, but then 18 months later, it's not available anymore. And it's like such a heartbreaking thing. But with Sportiva, I've never had that problem, you know, cause they're just, yeah, have shoes in line for a long time. That's cool. Yeah. Rock steady, man. That's yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. How would you, you know, explain to somebody that's looking to get a sponsor that's coming up in this world? Like, what would you, what kind of advice would you give them? Oh man, um, it's. Uh, I'm gonna go with. I'm sure you're familiar with Rick Rubin, mm -hmm. you know, and he like came out with a book recently about creativity basically so good, by the way. yeah i haven't read it yet it's on my list for sure but he was on a podcast that i listened to recently and the host was basically asking him she was like you know you're essentially like you have professional taste you know it's like what it's like what is good taste and bad taste and that led into this conversation about how like the creative process and like how do you um his basic thing was you can never make something with the audience in mind. Um, the minute an artist starts worrying about, you know, crafting whatever they're working on, a song, uh, I don't know, to put it concretely in the running world, like what your basic motivations are, like what races you want to run, what uh, maybe routes in the mountains you want to like contend or are inspired by. You can't be like, thinking, oh, I'm going to do this because this is going to catch so-and-so's eye and then, you know, I can be a sponsored athlete. You have to be operating from true motivation. Uh, and whenever someone is is functioning with like real motivation and passion, people take notice, I think. And uh, people are pretty good bullshit detectors. And yeah, it's you can't you can't like get you know past stuff 
I don't know, without people sensing that you're, you're doing it just for like a marketing reason or something. So I guess that would be my main thing is to anyone young and up, up and coming, uh, you have to know what motivates you, why you're doing this and stay true to that. And if you are pursuing those goals and objectives and way of doing things, uh, you know, true to yourself, it's uh, someone will notice and something will work out eventually. And the the upside to that is you won't feel like you're compromising yourself along the way. Either, totally. Because you know? that's, that's not a fun feeling to have, right? Where it's you're the just worst like, feeling to why have. Why did I do this? Yeah. No, it's, I remember I was a freshman in college and it was one of my early climbing partners and we were coming back from Shelf Road, kind of uh, outside of Colorado Springs, down near Canyon City. And we were listening to Radiohead and uh, Karma Police came on and he was also, he was a, he went on to become a philosophy professor, but, uh, and he was talking, he was like trying to explain to like 18 year old me, he was a senior, uh, I was a freshman about the lyric, like for a minute there, I lost myself, like, like what that's, you know, it's like the chorus basically in, in Karma Police, like what that meant and sort of like the existential man and all this. And like, you know, it took like. 15 or 20 years later for me to like finally understand that, you know, and it's like, yeah, like you, it's like one of the worst things in the world to feel like, yeah, you've lost yourself and what your core values and identity is, you know, and compromised it for, I don't know, validation, money. I mean, these things matter, but they can come from sources that are a little more nourishing and wholesome than, uh, you know, like Instagram likes and that kind of shit. 100%. You know? so, yeah. No, I love that, man. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. Yeah. Now, what a cool reference point too, to like go back to that conversation with your friend and. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was an influential person on me. Um, and you know, really had, it's a timeless band, like continues to be a favorite of course, but yeah, it's, I think it's an important concept. He's like always being vigilant about like checking in with yourself. Am I being true to what my values are? So, yeah. Do you have any moments like that for yourself along your career where you felt like you have lost yourself or kind of lost touch with what you've been doing? Totally. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's tough. Um, but I think everyone goes through those moments and ups and downs and it takes, it's an ongoing process. You know, I'll be 40 in a couple of months and I expect 10 years from now, I might look back at being 40 and be like, what were you doing, dude? Yeah. You know, like, like, God, am I, you couldn't, you didn't have it together yet, even at 40, <laughs> you know, like, so I try to, I don't, I'm not too harsh on that. I mean, like everyone goes through that. Uh, but it's just being, having that self-awareness, I think is really important to, you know, living like a satisfying and like fulfilling life for sure. Totally. Yeah. Do you think it's gotten more difficult to be aware with the advent of social media and things like that? Huh? Or does that like, I guess, does it drive the wedge further for people of like, you know, losing yourself a little bit more? I think social media has normalized the process of losing yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like this, you know, 30 years ago, selling out was like, a verboten concept and now it's sort of like selling out's the point you yeah know? it's like i want the brand deal you know um I, I again like i hesitate to judge that stuff too harshly because different generations are always different um stuff i was and did when i was coming up probably horrified the older generation um so i don't want to be like that like finger wagging like old man you know <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I think social media has probably just kind of like it's just homogenized culture so thoroughly and made it normal to like, yeah, compromise any kind of like underlying value structure probably. Heck yeah. Well, I love the fact that you talk about like not wanting to judge it too harshly because you're, you know, looking back at your younger self or whatever it may be. How important to you is having that growth mindset? Because you're able to look back and say, like, I was doing this 10 years ago or, yeah, yeah. you know, in 10 years, I'll probably look at myself. Like, it seems like you have a really good finger on the growth mindset polls. I mean, growth is kind of the point, right? Like, that's always, uh, I think it's become a little buzzwordy, but it's, I think there are a lot of people in society who either don't have the privilege to even be thinking about these things or 
have distracted themselves or numbed themselves to the uh, realities of their life to where like they don't have the ability to self-reflect about, you know, am I challenging myself? Am I pushing myself to learn new things, try new things, become a better person, evolve? Um, so yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta be thinking about personal growth always. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. As you've, you know, cemented yourself here in Boulder, um, do you have favorite routes that you're loving out to go out on all the time? I see on Instagram the thing that we're talking about not being the best thing in the world. Yeah. But I see it all the time. No, but I mean, Instagram, yeah. I mean, I have, I've talked about this before, but man, there are definitely, I think, best case scenarios for social media in my life. Like I've made friends through social media that I think are, there, there's connections that never would have happened otherwise. And they're connections that I value, you know? Um, but I think that's kind of like, yeah, peak social media, like best case yeah. scenario. Um, but no, but routes around Boulder here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've lived here for 14 years now. Um, again, over the last decade, I've kind of diversified it into becoming a climber, like in a serious way also. And that's affected my favorite routes a lot because it just opens up more terrain and and different lines on the landscape, uh, more technical terrain that requires different skill sets. And those routes also, they have fewer people on them than the major trails going up and down green or mountain or bear peak and, and you know, open space outside of Boulder. Um, so yeah, my, my favorite routes tend to involve rock and scrambling uh, woven into a larger, like longer run. So heck yeah. 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 Do you love at this point being able to have multi-sport days where you're like running, riding and climbing, or is it just kind of like, are you segmenting out when you're going out? I know the multi-sport stuff is really fun to me because it's so multifaceted. It's, it's so engaging. It, it, you know, engages different parts of your brain, different skill sets. Um, yeah, it's just more, uh, it's more complicated and that's more complex and that's rewarding than simply running down a trail or doing just one of the things, you know? Um, so yeah, my favorite days outside involve like probably like riding my bike to a trailhead, running some approach, scrambling or climbing something and then doing it all backwards, you know, back to, back to town. So, that's so cool. Yeah, Again, yeah. it goes back to kind of what I said at the beginning of this episode. That's always been so inspiring to me about how you approach things is that it's, you're just you're you are the tool and you're going out there and you're getting to do a little bit of everything and yeah and it's all the same thing too it's all like the it's like human driven like, yeah, yeah well it's all like to me there's not much the core um motivation behind climbing running biking is all the same of using my body and mind in concert to integrate myself into my surroundings and you know, it's really rewarding to have the skill set to do that all efficiently and effectively. So yeah. that's so cool. Do you think that that's something that people can actively train for, like using all of the, like developing all those skill sets, or is it something that just kind of gonna kind of has to come naturally? Um, so this is gonna sound funny, but I've always considered myself I'm not a very athletic person, and I mean what I mean by that is like my core talent is basically just endurance. Um. But, you know, I was always picked last on the playground, that kind of thing. Most of the people that I do these more technical activities with, skiing or climbing in particular, which are more technical sports, they're they're more athletic than I am. Like these are – and I'm always just impressed and humbled by uh, how much worse I am at this stuff than most of my partners, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm always grateful that they're still willing to partner up with me. But uh, I guess that's all to say that – I don't think there needs to be an innate talent for this stuff, but you do have to develop a basic level of competency, you know, especially in uh, a high consequence sport like rock climbing where gravity never, never rests and one mistake can be the end of it all, you know, if you're not minding your P's and Q's. So um, yeah, it just takes, it just takes practice and, um, like you know the appropriate steps along the way so thank you yeah. yeah. 
does your mindset or what you're thinking about change when you're out there, depending on whether you're out there for fun, whether you're out there racing and by sport? Yes. Um, I think a criticism of someone like myself is often they're like, why don't you slow down and like smell the roses, you know? And my response to that is the experience I'm looking to have, which is one of like deep focus, flow state, um, you know, this magic nexus of challenge and ability uh, requires me operating closer to my limit. Like I'm not going to achieve that state just walking down a trail or pedaling easy on the bike, you know? Um, so I, the, the ideal in any of these activities is to be getting in that zone of like focus and flow. Um, so in that sense, they're all the same. And that's why intensity is important. That's why racing is so gratifying is because you're trying your best at something and everything is set up that day for you to try your hardest. Um, I don't know. That's kind of the way I approach those things. Heck know? yeah. So as you're out there putting in these hard efforts and, you know, sometimes you're mentally fatigued or anything, are you ever like trying to solve those hard physics questions in your head as you're going or like just kind of distracting yourself or are you just trying to get through the task? No, no, I definitely. There's definitely no hard math going on. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. So like in a race situation or any high intensity effort, um, I'm not distracting myself. I'm like dialing into the moment as much as possible. Uh, so like I never listen to music or, um, podcast or anything during a race. Cause I wouldn't be listening to it. I, I wouldn't be paying attention to it. Um, day to day life. I listen to that stuff all the time. Um, and it's not out of distraction. It's more, it's almost just like the, you know, the modern malaise of like multitasking. It's just like, Oh, this is an opportunity to catch up on the podcast, catch up on news and like, you know, this or that interview, you know? Um, but yeah, no, if I'm doing something that's important to me and, uh, is high intensity. I'm, I'm focused. I'm paying attention. Yeah. Heck yeah. So as you become mentally fatigued in these like highly physical moments, is there anything that you're kind of practicing, you know, in your brain or anything like that, that you've developed over the years that helps you get through those harder moments? Oh, uh, it's more just like active and audible self-loathing. It's, uh, I don't have any mantras or anything or like focusing techniques. It's just, like usually it's uncomfortable enough that like my focus is brought to bear on the situation. I can't, I'm not going to be distracted from like how much my legs hurt or like, yeah, you know, how nauseous I am. Um, I just try and remember, I guess, that that moment of choosing to continue to focus and push hard or to slack off, like that moment is why I've signed up is like that that test is like why I'm there, you know, it's, and it's what makes the day memorable too, is sure. like confronting that moment, meeting it and like rising to the occasion, like not letting yourself down by not trying your hardest, you know? Um, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Has there been like a specific instance where you're out exerting yourself or like you get to a resting place that you've had like a profound, you know, mindset change or experience? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I've had some, it seems like they mostly happen on the bike. Uh, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking about specifically, but this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, <laughs> I feel like on the bike, and I think it's because it's quite a mechanical motion. So it, it can be a little, your mind can wander mm -hmm. and like can go to different places but on solo bike tours, long bike tours, or even just like a long, hard day out, um, it usually requires music as well. But something gets triggered sometimes. It's just like, it's like euphoria, transcendence. Basically, you're just feeling the world in like an all-encompassing, intense way, you know? And those moments are like the main reason, like those, those are like the best case scenario moments. That's like why, you know, I might be out there for a couple of weeks on a bike tour is because I know that a couple of those moments are going to happen. And yeah, it's, um, I don't know. It's crazy. It's definitely like a consciousness altering 
kind of state and they feel profound, you know, as silly as it sounds. Um, I suspect that it's part of what some people are ac accessing through like psychedelics. Um, I've never done any psychedelics, you know, beyond like severe physical exertion and caffeine. Um, <laughs> But those two in concert can, I don't know, they can take you to Produce some, some crazy yeah, effects. Yeah, they can take you to some crazy places, at least for me, especially when you start adding music into the mix. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's what I would yeah, say. So. That's cool. You talked a little bit right there about being out on these long solo bike tours. What's the longest like push you've done so far? So, yeah, two years ago, I did a 21-day tour solo uh, that was 2,300 miles. And along the way, I climbed six different mountains, um, most of them being like the highest point in the range or the state. And, you know, when you're talking about states like Wyoming and Montana, uh, Utah, those happen to also just be really remote. Like Colorado is a, like a, an oddly like developed and urban state. You know, like the highest point in the state's Mount Elbert. It's 10 miles round trip from the car. You know, that's just like, that's super mellow. It's like two hours. Um, but when you get into Wyoming or Montana, you're looking at, you know, 25 to 40 miles round trip from the car. And so you're out there all day and it's like technical and off trail. Um, yeah. So it was, that was the biggest trip I've done three weeks alone on the bike uh, with a lot of like running and technical scrambling involved too. Uh, and that's my favorite kind of trip that involves, you know, kind of like all three of those activities that I enjoy the most. That's cool. When you're out there on any of these bike tours, have you ever been so far remote and like had a mechanical and just had to throw the bike on your back and like run it out? Like, no, I don't think so. Definitely nothing that I couldn't. I've had like some inopportune flats that, you know, maybe I threw like a tire boot in or something. Um, nothing that like failed catastrophically like i've had a handlebar break but i was able to kind of like rig it to where i could get to the next town and you know get a better fix um no nah, i don't know i try and keep my bikes on long tours like that uh fully mechanical like no hydro brakes no electronic shifting like i want it to, i want the bike to be the simple f form that i can fix everything on like in the field you know um i mean last year actually i was in a bike packing race uh, across the state of Colorado, 600 mile race. And with a hundred miles to go, I ended up dropping out because I'd broken a couple spokes oh. and they were, um, it's this envy wheel set with internal nipples. So I'd have to like tear the friggin' wheel apart in yeah, order to like, no good way to solve yeah, that to, to tension and true it. And if I just had an external nipple, like most wheel sets, um, I could have like trued the wheel and probably been fine, you know, like retentioned it. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so that one was, that one, I guess was catastrophic, but I've since like realized that I probably could have risked it and just continued on. Like, cause it wasn't like wobbling so much that it was just, it just wasn't true anymore. Yeah. Um, but you know, you live in there and next time I'll know to keep rolling on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till it just completely explodes. Hopefully not. You yeah. Know? Those, those, those expensive are rims. Tough. Like, yeah. 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 But I mean, those carbon, yeah, those, those envy ones in particular are like, yeah. it's such a stiff rim. Yeah. You, you don't want to blow like, those things up. Yeah. So as somebody who has accomplished a ton of really incredible goals throughout your career, how do you continue going about setting goals for yourself? Like, are you trying to kind of one up the previous things or just trying to do stuff that makes you happy at this point in time? It's a combination of both. I'm in the process of that right now. Like I've, the last couple of weeks, I've been really trying to like commit to some kind of big uh, goal for the month of July. And so I've been asking myself, you know, that question a lot. Like, you know, what is, what truly motivates me? Why does it motivate me? What's, and I don't know, those things are hard to answer and it's hard to, because then I'm balancing all of that with kind of like life logistics and what my body is going to like tolerate too. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's probably like the most common thing that my mind is contemplating is like, what do I want to be doing? And because I'm keenly aware of like how fortunate I am to be in a position where I'm a sponsored athlete. So I have, I can take a month off of my life to go on some giant bike tour, you know? Um, so I want to be sure to take advantage of those opportunities, but 
yeah, it's a combination of all that. Heck yeah. So you've touched a couple times on being close to turning 40 this year. Yeah. What is the thing that continues to inspire you these days? What drives you? Oh man. Yeah, it's those moments that I was talking about. It's like when you I don't know, there's you're chasing like that that moment where you feel like you're the hero in your own movie that is your life. <laughs> And uh, everything feels like it's in its right place and you're doing the right thing at the right moment in time and uh, creating, having objectives that you're working towards along the way that offer up an opportunity to have those moments. That's kind of what it's all about. I don't know. And it's, that inherently means like pushing yourself in new different ways uh, in order to be challenged so that you can have uncertainty and adventure in your life. Mm -hmm. For sure. At this point in time, how are you balancing back and forth between choosing to go out and do races or just like solo projects for yourself? Uh, again, it's, it's constant. Like I'm in that mode of right now is like, it's like, oh, I'm still like, cause right now I'm feeling quite healthy running. it's like, uh, you owe it to yourself to like do a couple races because you're only getting older and that ability is going to just erode more and more. Um, at the same time, there's like some larger personal projects I want to do that also require like extreme firmity of the of the body, you know. And so it's that's I'm right smack in the middle of one of those. I don't have <laughs> I don't have a good rubric for you know like these are the pros and cons. This this okay, do that. You know, just kind it's, of going whatever you feel the most compelled to. Yeah, do. it's a gut instinct thing, and it's a circumstantial thing with what the body will tolerate. Yeah. Do you feel like you still have the same level of competitiveness or like desire to compete in you as you did when you were younger? Absolutely not. Um, when I was in my twenties and even my first half of my thirties, I was extremely competitive. Uh, and looking back, I know now that it was all a form of like seeking validation and kind of feeding the ego and, I'm not even saying that those are bad things. And I think those are natural things at that stage in your life. But I do think that I don't want to put a prescriptive value on it, but for me at least, it, it's not sustainable to, to continue with that mode of being. You like, you have to evolve, you have to gain some perspective. Um, otherwise, like, what are you doing with life? You know, if you're, if you're, Motivated by the same things when you're 40 as when you're 25, it kind of seems, and it ends up being like a little bit sad, maybe. Yeah. Um, I feel like that kind of also develops a lot of burnout in a lot of people. Like you burn too hot for too long, and like yeah. the ego just like eats you alive. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's it consumes you, and I think you know that's not healthy, obviously. So I don't know. I still really value competition, but it's not as a means of beating other people. It's as a means for having that day where everything is set up for me to like be at my best mm -hmm. um, and be the best version of myself and be in that unique situation where there's maybe like, you know, the community of other racers um, and people around you, supporters that are allowing you to like be at the peak version of yourself. And that's a important shift from doing a race to like, prove something to the public or to beat a certain person or to, to win, beat everybody. Um, again, I don't think that's necessarily unhealthy, especially say in your twenties, but it's just not a motivation for me anymore. I just don't feel the same need for validation that way anymore. Yeah. yeah that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's cool to hear how like your relationship has grown and changed and progressed over the years with competition. Well, you just start evaluating your, uh, your value in the world differently. It's like not, um, oh, my identity isn't tied to like if I want to race or not. It's more tied to like how or like how I value myself to how I'm treating other people in my life, what kind of effort I'm putting into relationships, um, how true I'm staying to core values, that kind of thing, you know? And I don't know, in another decade, it might, evolve in a different way too. So, yeah. you, know, you we'll touched see. on it a little bit there too, but like, do you feel yourself interacting with people who are a fan of you or like fans at the race a little bit more now when you 
do get to go out there than you used to just since you have grown and matured a little bit? I think I'm just a little more tolerant of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that probably means like the interaction is a little bit different. Yeah. It's like, um, you can't fault somebody for being, I, I recognize what a privilege it is to inspire other people. Uh, and that it's not, it's just getting over yourself, you know, like, yeah, like this person's desire to meet me is at least as my important, is at least as important as my desire to be left alone, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, that, but um, yeah, so I don't know. I think I've hopefully just gained a little perspective on it. Heck know? yeah. Well, talking a little bit about like quieting the ego and like this growth mindset at this point in your life, how are you going out to like re-energize yourself or fill your cup back up and like to continue to stay inspired oh it's it's yeah being able to do uh trips either solo or with my partner Haley that don't have any like uh you know kind of like job obligations around them which you know is hard to do because it, you end up taking you have all these opportunities and you take trips and, and like you're kind of always thinking like, oh, I'll kill two birds with one stone. I can like take a bunch of photos on this trip and, you know, then I can write up this thing and produce this piece for this sponsor or whatever. It's like but that just totally takes away from just like you being out there with each other experiencing something rather than like posing for a photo and then, you know, having this pressure to like produce this article afterwards or something, you know. So – yeah, not doing that stuff is the way that, yeah, you know, you would get re-energized. That's super yeah. cool. It's been really cool over the last couple of years seeing you and Haley going out on these yeah. incredible adventures. Do you have a specific one that stands out to you the most as something that has, like, refilled your fire to get out there or, like, just made you feel like, this is why I do this? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's pretty much any time we get to go on a bike trip together feels that way. But it's funny because she and I just gave a talk last night up in New Belgium in Fort Collins about riding bikes and stuff. And one of the trips that we highlighted in there was this one we did a couple of years ago in Nebraska. And it was just a six day bike tour. And it was right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, everything was locked down. So we were like cooking our meals on a stove, you know, this kind of thing, like, you know, barely anything was open. And there was just like there was no obligation around it. Like it was, it was just us. Like, I mean, I, you probably remember how the pandemic was and the world was shut down. It was like kind of sweet for a couple yeah, there months. There was some where, beauty built in. Yeah. There, where it's just like, oh, it's kind of a vacation right now. Yep. Yeah. So like that trip in particular sticks out because A, that's the longest trip that she and I have done together, six days. Um, and B, yeah, there were no external. It was truly just, we wanted to do this. We went and did it. Um, yeah. Yeah really cool like 550 mile tour uh in nebraska which is where i'm from but the western portion of the state is super unpopulated remote and yeah really fun for riding bikes you know? do you enjoy getting to go back home now because it seems like you've been doing that a little more frequently lately yeah well like you know my dad's getting older and um i think you know as i age i just like see the importance of that relationship more and more um so I try and get home as much as possible. Uh, but it's funny because the bike completely sh like reshaped how I viewed where I grew up. You know, like running was like an okay way to explore where I grew up. But but a bike and a gravel bike, you know, riding all the gravel roads around there, dirt roads, like pasture tracks is definitely the best way to experience that place. And so it's been really cool to like rediscover where I grew up. I would say the last like three or five years um, since I've really gotten into riding bikes. Yeah. Do you feel like you have like a new uh, love for the place that you grew up through that? Yeah, hundred percent. Totally. Like there's a lot of things about it that like I it would be hard to be there full time, but uh, it is cool to have at least one activity that like feels really optimal for that that region that's know? cool yeah, yeah. do you ever see yourself being out there full-time or do you think you'll always be by the mountains is that where you feel <sighs> drawn to the most yeah i don't think i'll ever be there full-time but i could see Haley and i being there for like portions of a season you know a couple months at a time kind of thing depend just depending on you know what happens with their lives and stuff but um 
Yeah, I mean, because my, you know, my family, we have 640 acre like ranch out there. Wow. And, yeah, it's a lot of land. Um, and that's something I don't take for granted either. Just like having a chunk of the world like that. That's it's probably so call, peaceful. Yeah, that you can call your own. And, you know, obviously I have like deep roots too. So, yeah. That's really awesome. Do you ever see yourself leaving Colorado or do you think that this is probably going to be home primarily for, for I think I think we'll always be in Colorado. Um, or at least, you know, as far as I can tell. Well, we've definitely talked about moving somewhere else other than Boulder, but yeah, Colorado feels pretty Again though, I mean Haley's from North Carolina and we go back there at least once a year, it seems like now, to western North Carolina and Man, that um, place is cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess OB is out there as well. Uh -huh. Like, yeah, it's um, it's nice. It's cool. It's like it's funny because you know the East Coast is so much more populated than the West, but Western North Carolina in general is like so much less hectic than the Front Range. Like, yeah, it's like a little oasis out there. You know, it's yeah. it's starting to get crazier over the last few years. I feel like, but like, yeah, yeah, you can go ride bikes, you can go run, you can go climb, and just like it's possible to not see anybody. And like, that's almost impossible in the front range doing those things. For yeah, sure. So uh, yeah. Thinking about moving out of the Boulder area. Is there any places in Colorado that like call to you? Oh man. I don't know. We would definitely like to stay in the Boulder area, but just in terms of like buying a home, it's going to probably end up having to be like up in the Hills a little bit, um, which is fine. Uh, I mean, but it's funny. Cause like we've looked into kind of like central Colorado, like, Sort of like the BV to Salida Zone, and it's, it's gone crazy. It's not any cheaper than Boulder. <laughs> I know it's funny because I think about like growing up in Colorado and thinking about like Salida back then. And yeah, like, yeah. It just always had this like almost you know not a great place. It's kind of like a dumpy Poor, feel right? to it. Like yeah, we yeah. we didn't go there when we were younger, and now it's like I feel the same way. Where I'm like, I would kill to live in Salida. Exactly. Yes, I'm Salida sick. I mean, you know, me spending summers in Leadville. Uh, you know, five different summers living up there. It's, it's the same way. Like it's, it's still people are gonna hate me for this saying this. It's still like the dumpiest of those three towns. Oh, it certainly you is. You know, but like, there's a brewery, there's a distillery, yep, there's a couple changing. coffee shops, there's a couple bike shops. Yeah, you know, like the cornice is starting to fade because they. Yeah. But that is the one place up there I feel like that people talk about Leadville so much, and you still go up there and it has this like just kind of grungy core to it and you're like yeah. this is a, this is still a mountain town god I, just, I was just up there two weeks ago and just like rolling by like a real estate sign it was like three bedroom house but it was like 700k and i was like what yeah <laughs> like how was that because it wasn't like some crazy fancy house it was just a house mm -hmm. I, it's funny you say that i have a friend who just bought some property up there with a house on it and initially, he was just going to kind of like strip it down to the studs and redo it. Yeah. And he spent a lot of money on it. And he got into the project and he ended up demolishing the whole oh, house because no. it was like from, you know, like the 1800s. And like, yeah, it was pretty rough. It was like four different house, like pieces of the, the build put together. Totally, and yeah. yeah, it's like you spend all that money and then you have to start just, over. Just start over. <laughs> Dude, yeah. It's crazy. But uh, well, yeah, so everything you do seems to be very intentional. Is oh, that yeah. something like what role does that play in your life? Like intention or are you, do you uh, feel like you're more sporadic? It seems I like. try to be intentional. This yeah. is something Haley and I talk about a lot, like living your life proactively instead of reactively, you know, cause that just gives you like a sense of agency over your life too. Instead of just like, cause it's so, there's just like so many demands placed on you and so much shit coming at you all the time that you can easily go through life, just reacting to it all the time. But then you know, you get 10 years down the road and you're like, well, what am I even doing? You know, like what is, I haven't done anything in the last decade. So if you can be proactive with your life, yeah, it allows you to like chase the things that are truly important to you and uh, feel like you have some control over it. I think is something that, you know, humans are always looking for, even if it's an illusion. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I, I would say that's the role that intentionality has in my life is like trying to be yeah, like proactive with my life and not just reacting to everything all the time. That's super cool. As someone who loves perpetual movement, how do you navigate like the downtime and injuries? I know you said you've changed a little bit over the years, but yeah. like what are you doing to like, you know, keep yourself sane in those really hard moments? Uh, I just change what I'm doing. Like I, you know, if like if the running isn't working, I emphasize the bike more. Uh, if the running's going well, I put my energy into that. Um as I'm getting older, I've been getting overuse injuries with the climbing. 
you know, my shoulders, my back, like, you know, elbows, fingers, that kind of thing. Um, but generally climbing is pretty reliable too. So I just, I'm, I feel fortunate to where I've gotten to a point that I inherently enjoy cycling and not just as like an alternative activity to running. So yeah, r- riding a bike's pretty reliable. That's, that's usually the way I cope with any kind of like running injury I'm dealing with. Do you feel like you're becoming more aware of like injuries coming on, like being more in tune to your body as you're, you know, getting a little older and you're like, okay, I can feel that I'm overusing this. Like I need to taper off and go over here. Definitely. hundred percent. Yeah. It's like at this point in my life, you know, almost 30 years into it. Um, I, I kind of know, like, I'm not really going to have a new injury anymore. I just know like the problem areas, it's like left Achilles, right knee, you know, like right lower back, like, you know, right hip, like these things are gonna, if I'm not careful, they're going to flare up. And so I've learned to not ignore the warning signs with them, you know? Um, but I think that just comes with like experience and maturity. Yeah. Something that we haven't talked about yet, but I feel like plays a pretty big role in your life, which is writing. Mm. When did that come into play for you? I mean, I've always, I've never had an aptitude for the sciences, even though I have a couple of degrees in science. Um, reading and writing has always been something that's come more easily for me. And it's the my primary mode of creative expression, I guess. Um but it's one of those things that I always feel like I'm not being productive enough with it. I'm not putting the amount of energy and time into it that I should. And I guess I say should because it feels like uh, it's like something that tangible that I actually have to offer the world. So much of this stuff can feel self-serving or like, oh, I'm doing this trip or going on, the, you know, working on this project because it's something that is exciting for me, but writing is a way then to like share it with the world and have something to offer up to the world that is larger than just myself. And I guess that's why I have a lot of personal feelings of judgment around writing. Cause it's the like I feel like it's the one thing I have to offer. And so I should be putting more energy into it, you know? So fair yeah. enough. Do you have any fit, uh, projects that you've worked on along the way that stand out to you as some of your best work? Oh, Jeez. No, I mean, something I'm working on right now, I'm hoping is like some of my best work, but it's, yeah, it's that case of, it's a balance. And it has to do with that three week trip I did two years ago. Cause I mean, that's a long trip and I felt like it's a lot of time to be inside my head. So there's like things I have to say about that trip for sure. Um, that I've been working on, but I've been writing this piece for, you know, over a year at this point, you know, so hopefully that is something that becomes tangible and real within the next six months and can share with the world. And I can't wait to check that. Yeah. Hopefully that'll be the best. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Do you have any plans for like a big novel or anything? Definitely not a novel. It won't, it won't be uh, it won't be, it won't be fiction, but I would like, yeah, to do some kind of large personal writing project in the near future for sure. Do you have any goals like for that? written out or anything like that or you just I mean, playing it by ear no i mean i i know in my head what i want to do but it's a matter of like committing and doing it yeah. for sure yeah. yeah especially when you're limited on time as is well that's sure. the thing it's like it's always a balance of like god this year we've been traveling so much it seems like and it's like in order to be effective at writing you have to like sit down grind put in the time uh because writing is really hard work i think um i don't know Maybe it comes more easily to other people, but, um, and there just hasn't been space for that this year at all. It's just like, maybe we'll have a, a week here at home in Boulder and then it's on to the next thing, you know? And so, yeah. On the other side of writing, reading is a huge thing in your yeah. life as well. Do you have any books that you revisit often? Uh, it's funny right now I'm rereading a book. Uh, I probably read this book maybe 2015, 2014, something like that. It's a uh, John Updike's first book in his classic rabbit series. Um, it's called rabbit run. It has nothing to do with like the sport of running. It has to do with like running away from the problems in his life. I would say <laughs> like leaving his marriage. Um, yeah, I'm, I just started rereading that last week. I don't have any book that I go back to consistently, but I just feel like I've read a lot of things maybe 10 years ago that now with 10 more years of my life, I'm, I've been excited to reread with different perspective and um, I 
have like a whole different understanding of them than I did a decade ago. Yeah. So that's really cool. I love how, you know, perspective and like the way you look on different things changes throughout life. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think before being with Haley, I would judge myself if I wanted to reread something, but she's a big rereader. Like she, like she's <laughs> read, you know, um, Oh, a couple of Salinger's books, like seven or eight times or something, you know, and I just like, I've never read a book that many times. So I just feel Yeah, sometimes more I feel like it's like a broken record. I know exactly yeah, that feeling. Yeah, but I feel more validated in like revisiting particularly good books. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So being a well-known figure in the outdoor community, do you have any messages or advice for people who are aspiring athletes or outdoor enthusiasts looking to find their own path? I mean, it's basically exactly what I was saying earlier about like, not trying to do what you think will be popular or get you some kind of deal, but instead being really honest with yourself about what motivates you, what gets you excited and uh, pursuing that like with rigor and focus and passion. So, Heck yeah. yeah. Which and sounds like, I mean, it's just like, I'm speaking super vaguely and like, but that's because it's so individual. Like yeah. I can't tell somebody like what, what gets them amped. It's not one know? size fits all, right? Yeah. And like what, what works for you is not going to work for everybody else. So vague is the perfect yeah. way to respond to that. But definitely if there's one thing I know, you're only going to succeed at something if you have true passion for it, you know, and there's like, there's like a real inner motivation for it because otherwise how are you going to find the energy and I don't know to go after it. So, yeah. Yeah. Given your overall contribution to ultra running, even if your future doesn't involve racing, how do you see yourself continuing to make an impact and inspire others in the community? Oh, uh, this is a really good question. I was just talking with Haley yesterday about, um, I don't know, I have like this low key goal now to finish Leadville 10 times, finished it four times, uh, I've dropped out twice, uh, the level 100. And I was thinking about like the years that like my body's not cooperating and not, uh, I can't run, actually run the race. Um, I want to like get into the habit of volunteering for the, it's called the hopeless age station. It's up at like 12,000 feet at tree line on hope pass, the high point of the course. And, uh, it's cool because they they walk in there with, with llamas every year, hike in there with llamas. Oh, like, that's cool. Yeah. To like haul in all the supplies for the age station. So basically you have to camp out up there for like three days and, um, I don't know. That's something I can see myself really getting excited about. And like, you know, I've run that race six times. I have such a relationship with not just that event, but the whole region, the Arkansas River Valley, the Sawatch Range. Um, you know, I've been going there for over 20 years since moving to Colorado. That something like that is how I envision being able to give back going forward. That's super cool. And I'm sure too, for people that are competing, walking in there and seeing you a veteran of the race, that would yeah. be such an inspiring thing. So yeah, I mean, that'd be, a, that'd be like a side benefit. Hopefully yeah. to like uplift. Yeah. And boost, boost someone's race at mile 45 or whatever, you know, no doubt. So that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, we've talked about so many incredible things throughout this journey here. I would like to know what your favorite part of your professional career has been. If there is any things that you can single out, because I know there's probably an infinite number. I mean, always the goal has been to be like self-directing autonomous with my day-to-day -day life. And that's why I continue to work with brands and pursue different opportunities is because it gives me a freedom in my life that I value really deeply and at this point like an office job sounds i just i don't know, I probably wouldn't be able to function in it you know like i've been doing this for over 15 years unemployable like, in an office yeah yeah it's kind of <laughs> it's it's kind of scary but at the same time i trust myself to like you know be open to opportunities and make things continue to make things work so Heck yeah. yeah well looking ahead what are some of your goals or aspirations for the future of your career oh i mean it's you know, it's like talking about giving back, like that's something I feel like I'm at an appropriate time in my life where that becomes more the focus than anything that I'm doing, like just for myself. But, uh, you know, part of that can be continuing to pursue certain types of uh, adventures that go on to like inspire other people. But I, I do want to like get more integrated into like the like the community in terms of whether that's 
running, climbing, or cycling. Um, yeah, just doing things to to lift up the whole community, which can be trail work or volunteering at a race or mentoring, that kind of thing. So that's, I don't know. Those are things I think about a lot and, you know, need to start acting on. <laughs> yeah, that's the hardest part, man. Yeah, well, it's just like where to put your energy, you know, like yeah. what's going to be most effective. And, yeah. yeah. And if you could go back and give yourself, your younger self, any piece of advice from the almost 40-year-old you, if you could go back and talk to 18-year-old Anton, what would you tell him? 18 years old. Um, <laughs> man, I don't know. I, what I was going to say was that you don't need to stress so much about you like your grade in this physics course. But I think that's a super valuable experience to have in your life to be under that kind of academic pressure and like rise to the occasion. And it could just shapes you and your character in such a way that that skill of like being under deadline or being under pressure just helps so much later in life. So I don't know. I don't think there's, I don't know. Everyone finds their own way along the way. Like telling someone something earlier on isn't going to change the way that they did anything or like you have to figure it out on your own, you know, and you don't want to be told the answer anyways. Yeah. And, and and when you're young, you're, you're not, not gonna you're listen. not going to listen. Exactly. It's <laughs> like I certainly, I was not going to listen. I still probably don't listen. Um, so I never fault people in their like late teens or early twenties. Like, Cause man, I was the worst and I'm still uncoachable. Like I'm, I'm never going to have a coach again. Do you remember any advice you got from your younger years where somebody told you something uh, and you're like, you don't know what you're talking about. And now you look back on it and you're like, wow, I, I do wish I would have listened to that. All this stuff, you know, just all this, like run fewer miles, like have more focus. Um, okay. Here's, here's one thing. I think uh, I would say to my younger self, like be conscious of, the story that you tell yourself about your own life inside your own head. You know, like I think it's really powerful. The narrative that like is like the story that plays in our head about ourselves, you know, and creating that story. Um, it gives like structure and purpose to your life too. And it like, kind of helps you make decisions. And when you think like, well, how does this fit into the narrative arc of my life? You know, it's just it's just a different way of saying, like, be self-reflective, you know, yeah. and I do think that's important. And I think that's hard. At least it would have been hard for me when I was a teenager or a 20 year old to have that perspective of like, oh, I should be making decisions or it's important to be like constantly kind of updating and thinking about the progression of like my life narrative, because I think that's. Yeah, it's just a good way to be aware of like, okay, what am I doing? What am I working towards? How does this fit into what, you know, that is? Um, yeah. Beautiful words, man. Cool. This has been, again, such a beautiful journey. And I have one last question for you. This one might require a vague answer as well. <laughs> but do you have any parting motivating words for the people listening, um, looking to pursue an alternative lifestyle or mm. follow their passion? Parting words. Uh you know, uh, spend your money wisely. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, don't spend your money on shit, you know? Like, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Because people say, like, life's not about money, but money can, like, offer you a certain amount of freedom, you know? Uh, I feel super fortunate that I had a full tuition scholarship because then I don't have student debt. Then that freed up, gave me the ability to be living out of the back of my truck and not be working some job paying off my debt, you know? Um, so I don't know. It all adds up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, dude, thank you again so much for your time today. This has been absolutely incredible. Are there any projects that you have coming down the line, whether it's, you know, a project you're working on with a brand or anything you want to talk about before we wrap this up? Uh, I mean, I would love to plug something, but I'm in that moment of indecision right now, of like committing to what that thing is exactly. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to spray about pre-spray about something that doesn't end up Well, happening. if it pops into your head on yeah. the ride home or in the next <laughs> week or two, we'll you can record it at your house, send it over, we'll insert cool. it in right here. I mean, but yeah. yeah, dude, thanks again for your time. Like I said, this has been one that I've been so excited about the opportunity for. So this has been really cool. Cool. So, yeah. Thanks a lot for having me, Mike. Yeah, yeah, of course. 
Thank you guys for listening. If you're enjoying these podcasts on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you're listening to them on Spotify, Amazon, or Apple, please leave us a review. It greatly helps get the word out and allows us to keep this project rolling. Thank you for being a part of the Traction family. And we'll catch you on the next one. Keep being scared of normal. We're out.